we are carrying on with our series, Jewish Jesus, series through the Gospel according to Matthew. We're a few chapters in now, and Matthew, this first century Jewish man, is writing this Gospel account about Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, writing it for his Jewish brothers and sisters, telling them about this Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, this, this man who... Matthew is telling them, is the Messiah that the Jewish people were all waiting for. So far in the opening chapters, he's introduced Jesus as the son of David, the promised king who would reign forever on David's throne. In the opening chapters, he's told us about the events surrounding Jesus' birth and his early years. And then the last couple of weeks, he's fast forwarded to Jesus' 30s. So a few weeks back we heard about John the Baptist, this man who came preaching in the wilderness, proclaiming the coming Messiah, that he was there to prepare the way for the the Messiah to come. And that he was somebody so great that John, this prophet that everybody was going out to see, who was getting a bit of a name for himself, John said, I'm not even fit to lace this guy's shoes. Sandals, to paraphrase. Last week, we heard how Jesus came to John and was baptised by him in the Jordan River. And we had this amazing revelation of God as the Trinity, how the Father spoke from heaven, how the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus, and how Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the Father himself. So if you remember, as Jesus was baptised, he came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form, like a dove, and rested on Jesus. And the Father spoke from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And today's passage carries on from where we left off in the narrative. If you're taking notes, the title for today's sermon is Temptation. And I've got three points for you. Point number one is powered up for the mission. Point number two is the temptation. And point number three is the Lord alone is God. So we'll start at point number one. Seems a sensible place to start. This is powered up for the mission. So we begin in verse one. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So at this point, Jesus has not yet commenced his public ministry. As we heard last week, he's been living in relative obscurity for 30 years, just living a normal life, working a normal job. But he's about to begin his ministry. And Matthew has set the backdrop for today's passage, really, following on from his baptism. As we heard last week, that Jesus was God incarnate. He was fully God and yet fully man in one person. He never ceased to be God at any point, but in his humanity, he did have limitations and frailties, as we're going to see in today's passage. We also heard that at his baptism, the Holy Spirit rested upon Jesus. It rested upon him. And throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, when the Spirit rests upon someone, or was poured out upon them, it led to empowerment of that person by the Spirit of God, for the work of ministry. So whether that's a task the Lord has for them to accomplish, whether it's a mission or a prophecy to give, God the Holy Spirit gives them what they need for that task. And we hear in today's passage the same thing. How does the chapter begin? Matthew doesn't say, Jesus has gone and got baptised, and then he fancied a trip to the wilderness, so he went there. No, it says... Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. So it was a purpose. In Luke's account of this same occasion, in Luke chapter 4, it says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. So straight away we recognise that Jesus was relying on the Holy Spirit here for empowerment for his mission 
And all of the synoptic gospel authors stress this in their accounts. In Mark's account, he says, after Jesus was baptised, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. So that's even stronger language. It's like Jesus was compelled, he was sent, he was led, he was driven by the Spirit to go into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Now, Jesus wasn't forced against his will, kicking and screaming. He willingly submitted to the leading of the Spirit. And this is pretty profound. Jesus was God in the flesh. Sometimes people wrongly think of the Holy Spirit like some impersonal force, like the force in Star Wars or something. This vague entity that floats about. But the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third member of the Trinity. He's coexistent, co-equal with the Father and the Son of the same being, the same essence. We also see in the economy of the Trinity that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son sends him also. That's in John 15, 26. But the Spirit is a him, not an it. And here, in today's passage, we'll see that Jesus is empowered by the Spirit for what he's about to do. Which, as we'll see, was no small task. So he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And it says he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. So Jesus was out in the wilderness by the leading of the Spirit, not eating for 40 days and 40 nights. And then towards the end of that time, Satan came to try and tempt him into sin. And just like in his baptism, Jesus said, I come to do this to fulfill all righteousness. In this same scenario, we're going to see how, again, he is fulfilling the scriptures in his obedience to the Father. So today, he's out in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights. Just uh, just as Moses had been out in the wilderness fasting before God previously. Now Jesus has come as this greater Moses that we've heard about. In Exodus 34, 28, it says this about Moses. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. Now Jesus has come. He's doing the same. The greater Moses was now here to fulfill all scripture. And this was a time of severe testing. He's out in the Judean wilderness, out exposed to the elements, without food, possibly without water too, literally being starved. He was tired, he was exhausted, he was hungry and thirsty. Now, it was in the wilderness that Moses disobeyed God, and so the people were grumbling. They had no water to drink, and Moses sinned. But Jesus was greater. He didn't sin when he was in the wilderness. He didn't fail to obey. Moses died in the wilderness and didn't enter the promised land. But Jesus was the greater Moses. He was obedient. How do you reckon you'd get on out in the wilderness? Hungry and tired. You've gone days without food or drink. And then someone comes trying to goad you, prompt you, entice you into sin. How much more do we struggle with self-control and resisting temptation to sin when we're tired or we're hungry or we're stressed? How often do we do that? Can you relate to that at all? How often do we justify our sin because I was tired, I was hungry, I'm stressed? The truth is, our flesh is weak and we cannot walk with Jesus in our own strength. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to, to walk with him and to resist temptation. If Jesus relied on the Spirit here, albeit in his humanity, how much more do we need to rely on the power of the Spirit in our lives? Jesus was God incarnate, but Philippians 2, 6 and 7 says, Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So the language he uses here is he somehow emptied himself Without ceasing to be God, let me stress that, God, Jesus never ceased to be God at any point. But he did walk in the physical limitations of his humanity. 
I'll ask again, if the sinless Son of God was filled with the Spirit and needed to be filled with the Spirit for the task, how much more should we be asking the Holy Spirit to fill us, to live lives of godliness? We pray it in the Lord's Prayer. We say, give us this day our daily bread. So we're saying, Father, give me what I need physically, spiritually, emotionally this day. I need it from you. We say, lead us not into temptation. Help me. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. I need you to deliver me from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. We're going to him, asking of him, because we recognize that we need him. We need his power in order to obey him. Really, we are powerless without him. Trying to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit is like trying to drive a car with a flat battery. The engine won't even fire. I came out of work a couple of weeks ago. I was working out in Chorley. Got in my car, turned the key, and it was just completely dead. So you're going nowhere. That's what it's like trying to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of Luke, we read how Jesus would often spend time withdrawing to take time to pray, to seek his Father, to have communion with him. Again, how much more do we need to seek God in prayer and in his word, asking to be filled with the Spirit, asking to be empowered and emboldened to live for him in holiness? So Jesus is out in the wilderness and Satan comes to tempt him, to try and get him to sin. He's questioning him, trying to lead him away from the Father's will. Now, Satan is a liar and a murderer and has been from the beginning. He's been trying to lead man into sin since the garden. The first Adam bought into his lies and we are all still experiencing the result of those sinful choices that Adam made. But we read in the book of Romans that Jesus is the last Adam. He came to undo what Adam did through his sin. Jesus came to bring life. It says in, in Romans 5 that, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned, then he goes on to say, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. In other words, Adam's sin brought death to the world. Jesus' obedience brings life. When Adam was tempted by Satan, Adam didn't trust in the wisdom and power of God. He instead allowed his wife to be deceived by Satan and he followed his wife into sin, trusting in the wisdom of Satan instead of the wisdom of God. Satan said to him, Did God really say that? You will not surely die questioning God's character and the truth of his word. In John chapter 8, when Jesus is arguing with the religious leaders, Jesus says that Satan's native tongue is to speak lies. He's always speaking lies, counterfeiting the truth, twisting the truth. I notice Satan does the same thing in today's passage. He questions God's words when he comes to Jesus in the wilderness. At Jesus' baptism, the Father spoke from heaven. What did he say? What, what did he say before he said, this is uh, well pleased? This is my son. My beloved son. What does Satan say when he comes to Jesus to tempt him? If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you really are the Son of God, if you claim to be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread, feed yourself, prove it. So Satan goes straight in by questioning Jesus' divinity, like many false teachers do. Anytime you hear someone saying Jesus isn't God in the flesh, you need to recognize that this person is outside of Christianity. I had a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses knocked on the door the other day, and I was speaking to them briefly, 
And I, I said, I'm a, said, do you believe in God? I said, yeah, I'm a pastor of a church in Stockport. And I gave him a card that says the Trinity Church on it. And she goes, she takes it off me and goes, I'll give you that back. <laughs> if someone doesn't believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, a part of the Trinity, then they are outside of Christianity and we cannot call them a brother or a sister in Christ. The question in the divinity of Jesus, who he is, what he came to do. So Satan says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you really are the son, prove it. So this takes me on to point number two, which is the temptation. Matthew doesn't say how long Jesus was tempted for by Satan, but it seems like Jesus was in the wilderness for these 40 days and 40 nights fasting, and then Satan came to him. He says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter came. So it was like Satan picked his moment. He came when Jesus was at his weariest. He'd had no food 40 days. He was out in the wild, in the elements. The Gospel of Mark says that wild animals were with him. He was proper out there in, in the wilderness. When it says he was hungry, it seems like an understatement, doesn't it? He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry. I'm not sure if you've ever tried fasting for a day or more than a day, and, and what it's like, let alone 40 days. Jesus must have been starving, physically exhausted and Satan came to him at that point probably thinking I've got a chance here of getting him while he's tired while he's uh, not at his strongest physically so the strategy he goes for which is a sensible one if you want to get him is related to food when you're starving what's the one thing you're thinking about your next meal so he says if you're the son of God Sort yourself out some food. If you really are who you and your dad claim you are, turn these stones into bread. If you're God, you created Adam from the dust. Surely then you can turn a few stones into bread. And Jesus could have easily. Later, Jesus feeds the 5,000 with five loaves of bread. Everyone is stuffed. It's not that Jesus couldn't have done what Satan was asking him to do. Why could he not eat bread? Is it wrong to eat bread? Despite what some nutrition experts might tell you, eating bread isn't a sin. It isn't toxic and destroying your innards. I think it's reasonable to assume that Jesus was going into the wilderness for this time that he'd set apart to prepare himself for the beginning of his public ministry. And he was taking time to pray and to fast and have communion with his father. He was deliberately taking the time to fast from food. He was out there, remember, he was led by the spirit. He was walking in obedience with God. Getting away from people and distractions to spend an extended amount of time in prayer, communion and fasting with the father in the spirit. So he was taking the time to abstain from food and depend on God, depend on the grace of God more than food and that God would sustain him instead of food so to then eat food and break his fast he would not be doing what he had purposed to do and he would not be obeying or walking in the leading of the spirit he would not be a man of his word his yes wouldn't be yes Satan's trying to get him to not keep his word He's trying to get him to break his word by breaking his fast. Now, Satan knew that Jesus was God and that he could have done what he'd asked if he wanted to. But we read that Jesus answered him in verse 4. It says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. When I was a kid, my dad used to quote this verse all the time because we were... I was one of nine, so there was... A big table of all, all those kids out. And you'd, we'd have two plates of bread and butter on the table just to fill us up a bit, my mum said, because it's expensive feeding all them kids. 
And whenever the bread was run out, they'd be like, oh, is there no more bread? My dad would always say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Yes, food sustains us physically. We need it. We eat it every day. I'm sure most of us do, at least. But God is the giver of life. God is the sustainer of life. In John chapter 6, after Jesus has fed the 5,000, people come looking for him. Not because they think, oh yeah, this is God in the flesh, he's the Messiah. We read that actually they wanted to just fill the bellies. They wanted food, some, some food. And Jesus says to them, this is paraphrase, your fathers ate manna in the desert and they died. If you're just coming to me for bread, you're going to die as well. Your end will be the same as theirs. What you need really is the bread of God. And he tells them, I am the bread of life. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. In other words, look to God to be the one who gives life. Not food that's only going to keep you going temporarily. God can sustain us whenever and however he wants, with or without food. He can do that by his power. Now obviously, as I've said, Jesus is God. He could have turned stones into bread. But as we've read, he was walking in the spirit. He was relying on him to sustain him. He'd emptied himself. And Jesus here is an example for us. He is our example. He shows us dependence on God for all things in this passage. He shows us how to depend on God's power to sustain us physically, to depend on his wisdom, and how to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. Now, we can try and do things on our own, but bread alone isn't enough. We need God's word. We need to believe it. We need to know it, and we need to obey it. Jesus answers Satan with the word of God, and he quotes Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Again, Jesus is literally fulfilling the scriptures as he answers Satan during this temptation period out in the wilderness. The context of Deuteronomy chapter 8 is this. Moses is giving the people the law of God the second time. Where? In the wilderness. They've just spent 40 years in the wilderness because of their disobedience. Jesus is out in the wilderness 40 days, 40 nights. And in Deuteronomy 8.3 it says this. This is Moses speaking to the people. He says, And he humbled you, and he let you hunger, and he fed you with manna. If you don't know what manna is, they're out in the desert, there's no food to eat, and God miraculously provides manna from heaven. Manna means, what is this? Some kind of bread-like food that God provided miraculously. So it says, He humbled you, he let you hunger, and then fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The people of Israel needed to learn that he was their life giver, he was their sustainer. And we read that the Israelites continually didn't trust God at his word, despite his constant miraculous preservation of them in the wilderness. They were in the wilderness 40 years because of their own stubbornness and disobedience and rebellion. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, but he was obedient. He did what the Israelites failed to do. His perfect life of righteousness is imputed to his people. And this is just one time of his faithful obedience in a life free from sin. We know that his righteousness is credited to us as believers. His faithfulness to the word of God is credited to our account if we are in Christ. And that's how he fulfilled this passage in Deuteronomy. And Jesus is the living word of God. John 1 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now today's passage isn't the only time we read about Jesus going without food either. In John chapter 4, after Jesus meets the woman at the well, his disciples are urging him to eat something. Come on, Jesus, you need to eat something. You've not eaten all day. But he responds to them by saying, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So his food is to do the will of the Father. 
It's more important than a meal. Food can wait. Now, Jesus isn't just quoting scripture at Satan. He is obedient to that which he is saying. He's obedient and he's saying it. And he continues to be obedient as he goes through his ministry. His food of doing the will of the Father was far more important to him than physical nourishment. Again, in Luke 12, 23, Jesus is telling the disciples not to be anxious about food and clothing and what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. He says, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Seek first the kingdom of God and then he will give you what you need. Uh, I don't want to get philosophical on you, but when you think about it, life itself comes from the word of God. In the beginning, God spoke. He spoke. That's the word of God. God spoke. Let there be light. And there was light. The word of God literally brings life. Without, without the word of God, there is no life. Satan tries a new tact instead. He's not getting anywhere with that one. But in verse 5 we read, Then the devil took him to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. So Satan, he begins with the same statement again. He's challenging Jesus' authority and his personhood. And it says it takes him to the holy city. That's Jerusalem. And he sets him on the highest point of the temple. I've got a slide here, Nathan, if it's, if it's there. So this is just, as it says, a model of the second temple in Jerusalem period. In the, in Jerusalem period, in the second temple period. So one commentator I read said that the drop from the pinnacle of the temple, that tall bit at the back, um, it was built on the temple mount. So if you jumped right off the back, you would go right down the mount. So it was potentially hundreds of feet from top to bottom. Basically, if you jumped off that, you'd be dead. You'd be very dead. Right, you can go off it now. Satan says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. And this time, Satan, he's changed his tact. He quotes scripture to Jesus to try and trap him somehow. He says, for it is written. As if to say, if you're saying, oh yeah, yeah, you live by the word of God, every word that comes from the mouth of God. Well, what about this then? If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. So surely then, if you jump off this building now, God said in, in his word, he'll catch you. He's not going to let you be harmed. Satan's quoting here from Psalm 91. And if you read Psalm 91, it's a psalm about how God is a place of refuge for his people, how he's a saviour to his people. He preserves them, he keeps them. It's as if Satan is questioning the goodness of God. Is God really so good? Will he do what he's actually saying he's going to do? He says his angels will catch you. Prove it, jump off, show me. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, he answers with scripture again, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So again, he answers with the word of God. And he quotes again from Deuteronomy, which again was when Moses was in the wilderness giving the law to Israel. They were about to leave the wilderness and enter into the promised land. And in Deuteronomy 6.16, Moses says to the people, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massa. Now what is he referring to here when he says you tested him at Massa? Well, Massa was the name of a place and it means testing. It was also called Meribah, which means quarrelling. Now he's referring to an earlier event in the, in the wilderness, in Exodus 17, where Israel, they were in the wilderness, they were grumbling, they were complaining, they were saying, we've come out of Egypt, we're in the wilderness, we're hungry, we're thirsty. Did you bring us out here to kill us? We were better off in Egypt. Forgetting that they'd just come out of slavery. They'd been delivered, delivered miraculously from slavery by God. Now both 
Satan and the Israelites are guilty of doubting God's word here. Jesus is saying, don't put the Lord to the test. And Moses said the same to the people. But it's not that they were unsure. Lord, I've got some questions. I don't understand. Help me. Or anything like that. No, they were accusing God of not having a good character. They were accusing him of not being faithful. They were accusing him of wrongdoing. It's not that they can't expect God to fulfill his word. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, God actually tells people to test him. In that passage it says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you a blessing, until there is no more need. So it was about the motivation of the person testing God. When we come to God with questions or doubts, we should come before God with those questions. God knows what we think and what we know already. There's no point trying to hide it from him. But we should come in humility asking God, asking for wisdom, asking for understanding. We should never accuse God as if we somehow can put God on trial. God is the judge. But Satan is the accuser. That's who he is. He is the accuser of the brethren. Now Satan is using the words of scripture here. It's God's word. God's word is a life-giving word. But he's misusing God's word and twisting it for his own ends. And we need to be careful that we don't ever do the same. We should never use scripture as a weapon unless it's in a fight against the spiritual realm. So we should never use the scripture as a weapon on our spouse or our kids or other brothers and sisters or leaders or leaders to members. For example, the Bible teaches that the husband is the head within a marriage, he's the head of the wife and his wife should submit to him. But for a husband then to use the scripture to be domineering over his wife or to bully her or to get his own way or to treat her as a slave is a, is a wicked twisting of the scripture. Why? Because it's self-serving. The scriptures also say that a husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. That a husband should lay down his life for his wife like Christ did for the church. And that's the opposite of self-serving. It's sacrificial love. So husband and wife are one flesh together. The, the man is the head. But it's not like a boss and employee relationship or master and servant. Neither should leaders use scripture in this way that Satan is to get things they want to get done. Or to make people do the things that they want them to do. Uh, and the same goes both ways in any relationship. The scriptures are holy. They are life-giving words. So we should never use them by twisting them and trying to harm others, that which is life-giving. Now Jesus, for a second time, speaks the word of God in response to Satan to rebuke him and to stay faithful to his mission. Now the third and final temptation is in verse 8, which says... <clears throat> Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So he takes him to a high mountain. Now it could be that going to the pinnacle of the temple or going up on a very high mountain were just visions. So he didn't actually go there. Potentially did. Maybe he didn't. Maybe it was just a vision. Luke says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he says, you can have all of this. This can all be yours. All you need to do is bow down and worship me. Now I'm sure we've all seen or heard on films or TV programs or whatever when people sell their souls to Satan 
in order to get something they want. And then, invariably, it doesn't go very well in the long run, though they initially get what they want. The New Testament refers to Satan as the god of this age, who blinds the minds of unbelievers. It speaks about him being the prince of the power of the air, the one who leads the sons of disobedience in rebellion with him. But Satan can only do what God allows him to do. Any dominion Satan has is limited. Any dominion he does have is God-granted and ultimately is short-lived. Now imagine you were in this situation that Jesus was in. Would you be tempted? Money, sex and power are three things that the world offers that people want and often succumb to in pursuit of those things. Christians and Christian leaders included. Have you ever sat and spoke with someone, if I won the lottery, I would spend it on this, that or the other. Have you ever had that conversation? Yeah. That's because it has a pull on us. Satan's saying, all you need to do to get this, whatever you want, money, power, influence, all you need to do is bow down and worship me and you can have it. Now, in the beginning of Christianity, under Roman rule, it was like, you can keep your Christianity, all you need to say is, yes, I follow Jesus, but you also need to say, Caesar is Lord. And just offer a bit of incense at the temple to him, and you're good. Now, what does that look like for us today? We don't have temples to the cult of Rome. We don't have a Roman emperor. But we can be tempted to pursue things we shouldn't be doing, or to make compromises in our faith for the sake of gain, be it money, relationships, power, whatever. But as believers, we need to count the cost of following Jesus. Ultimately, what good is it to gain the whole world and, let, and lose your soul? You can't buy your way into the kingdom of God. And at the judgment, you will be outside the kingdom, where Jesus says there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, Satan's saying, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world but he's probably writing checks here that he can't cash. But either way, Jesus has had enough of him by this point, and he says to him in verse 10, Be gone, Satan, for it is written. And Jesus, for this final temptation, quotes again from Deuteronomy for the third time, which takes us on to our final point, which is point number three, the Lord alone is God. So Jesus again says, It is written. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The Lord alone is God. You shall have no other gods before me. There is only one God who rules and reigns over all of creation. And it's his creation, and it belongs to him, not to Satan. In Deuteronomy 6, we read that the Lord is a jealous God. He loves his people, and he's jealous for them. God is not a God who will share his glory with another. You cannot say, Jesus is Lord, and then say, Caesar is Lord. You can only serve one master. Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. What does Christ have in common with Satan? What does light have in common with darkness? You can only have one master. Jesus tells Satan to do one. He says, be gone. Get out of here. He rebukes him. He tells him to go, to leave. And then we read in verse 11 that the devil left him. And it says, And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Jesus perfectly examples this for us in this passage. He submits himself to God. He's in the wilderness at the leading of the Spirit. He's walking in the Spirit. He's tempted by Satan, but he leans on the truth and power and authority of God's words in all of his responses, 
and he's able to resist temptation, and then he tells the devil to go, and he goes. And then the angels come and minister, minister to him. Um, on that, in Luke 22, when Jesus is about to get arrested, he's about to go to the cross, we read that he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, in agony, praying earnestly, with sweat like drops of blood. And at that time too, God sends an angel to him to strengthen him. The angels came to serve him, to minister to him. Now that could have been to strengthen him somehow, physically, spiritually, maybe even bring food. It doesn't say. <clears throat> But what we do know is Jesus was victorious over Satan and sin on this occasion, despite all of Satan's attempts to get him to sin. Again, in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. We're also told in Ephesians 6, that he fires fiery darts at us. And that it's the shield of faith that enables us to extinguish, extinguish them. Paul says elsewhere in his letters, we're not unaware of the devil's schemes. And in another place he says, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. But if we resist him in faith, he will flee from us. And how do we resist Satan then? That's the question. Well, we resist him by knowing the scriptures, by speaking the truth to ourselves. In order to know the scriptures, we need to read it, or have it read to us, or listen to it. We need to know it experientially, by living it. We can resist Satan by praying, asking for strength. I think it's 2 Corinthians, can't remember what chapter, it says... We're taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. So a, a temptation comes into your head or a sinful thought, you take it captive and make it obedient to Christ. You turn from it. Another way we can resist temptation is by ringing someone, ringing a brother or a sister saying, I'm struggling, I'm feeling tempted to do this or that. Pray with me, help me. Have you got any counsel for me? But the good news is, Jesus has gone before us, and he has resisted temptation. He has been tempted in every way, yet without sin. If we're tempted and we sin, the good news is we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous, 1 John says. If we confess our sins, we will be forgiven. Jesus has been tempted in every way, yet was without sin. Some people will read this passage and they say, well, he's not really been tempted the same as us, has he? Because Jesus didn't have a sin nature. He was sinless. He was God in the flesh. How could he sin in the first place? We're already at a disadvantage because we're born in sin. There's no way he could have sinned. It's not even possible. But Adam and Eve were both created sinless in the garden. They were very good. But they both sinned. Though they weren't born in sin, they both sinned. Jesus' temptation in the wilderness was real temptation. It wasn't just some token temptation. It wasn't some symbolic thing. It was real. We have a saviour who can sympathise with us in every way in our weakness. He was tempted whilst having been fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. He was suffering in the flesh. He was feeling exhaustion. He was feeling hunger. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with us in our weakness, weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. The Bible is clear that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet he never sinned. He suffered in the flesh through trials, through hunger, through hard ministry, through reje rejection, and ultimately by giving his life in a torturous death. He experienced severe targeted temptation from Satan, greater than anything that we will ever experience. He suffered physically, 
greater than probably we ever will. He suffered, he was tempted, and he, over, he overcame on our behalf. And he did it for us because of his love. The verse I just read from Hebrews says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And the next verse says, Let us then, with confidence, draw near. Confidence, the word means literally with faith. Con, with, fide, faith. Let us, with faith, draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of the king, the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Why will we receive mercy at this throne? Because our high priest has gone before us. He has been obedient in every respect. He's been tempted, yet he was obedient. And his obedience is given to us as his people. We can boldly approach the throne of the king because of Jesus' perfect, sinless life. Because of him being the spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This passage should be an encouragement to us. And let it be so. Jesus is our example of perfect righteousness. But he's not just an example. He's our victor. He was victorious over sin. Where we fall short. He is our saviour. He saves us. He came to fulfil all that came before him. So the Israelites and Moses, they were disobedient in the wilderness. He was faithful. In him is life. He suffered in the wilderness without bread. But he is the bread of life. He will give us what we need. He will feed us. He will sustain us. He was tempted. But he overcame the enemy in his life. In his death. And in his resurrection. And so we too can overcome sin. By his power at work in us. He was our example. He humbled himself. He was led by the spirit. He was faithfully obedient to the father. So then let us. Depend on the Holy Spirit. Not on our own efforts or our own strength. But trusting in his work on the cross. He gives us all we need. He sustains us. He equips us. He even gives us armour to fight in the battle. Ephesians 6 says he gives us the armour of God so we can stand against the words, works of the enemy. He says put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, the shield of the faith, the gospel of peace on our feet. He gives us all we need in order to live this life. And he is our refuge. And he will do what he says he will do. And we can hide ourselves in his righteousness. We can give thanks that he has been obedient before us. That he has made the way. And that we can be saved, that we're safe in him. From Satan and all his schemes and all his enemies. Uh, all his workers. So let's put our trust in him. We're going to spend some time singing in response. Songs of worship to him. Our saviour our victor, our refuge. And we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. We remember that he gave his body, that his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So we'll take a moment to examine ourselves, think on that uh, as the kids come through from Sunday school. And we'll sing and then Nathan will lead us in communion.